Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I would like to thank uh, Jessica, Elise, and uh, all the organizers. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and hearing uh, from you, uh, hearing from patients. We don't get to do that a lot, especially for those like me who stay in the lab um, most of the time. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity, and I, I thank you for that uh, time. So um, I also wanted, um, I'm going to talk about pheochromocytomas and paragingliomas. And I, I just need to know if I have, uh, do I get to uh, advance the slides myself or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. All right. All right, great. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm going to talk about a different type of neuroendocrine tumors, pheochromocytomas and paragingliomas. I don't know if anybody here in the audience has uh, or had or has a family member with pheochromocytomas or paragingliomas. Uh, so they are a little bit different than uh, the neuroendocrine tumors that um, um, most of you are probably familiar with. But they have some unique uh, aspects and unique properties that make them related to these tumors in some manners uh, in terms of the embryology. So they share some properties. And uh, as I was uh, saying before, th there is a lot of commonalities between tumors. And we that deal with rare cancers uh, try to uh, learn from each other. And, and sometimes the knowledge that is learned from one group ends up being very related to others and help advance and, and propel that research further. So um, what I'm going to talk about, I have no disclosures other than I having been a grantee of NetRF Foundation, for which I'm very proud of. <laughs> and uh, so, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll give you a, a brief background on these tumors. I uh, will talk about um, the uh, Center of Excellence for Few and Para Research in, in Clinical Care that we developed at UT Health San Antonio. Uh, the progress that we've been having on this research and, and some uh, uh, projections of what might happen in the future. So I, I wanted to start by talking about precision medicine, which is a concept that has been um, advanced over the past years in uh, various areas in cancer. And the idea is that instead of um, combining all the patients into one same group, um, then we can see that individuals that have the same disease may behave very differently. Some people with very indolent disease uh, and others with very aggressive. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to bulk everybody together in the same uh, space and treat them the same way when they have intrinsically different diseases. So uh, the idea that if you understand what individual patients have, how the disease happens in that individual, then you might be able to provide a treatment that is specific to that individual. And that might not work well for others. So I think the idea of precision medicine is to find that, that perfect match between the patient, the patient's needs, and the treatment that that individual will get. So uh, what are pheochromocytomas and paragingliomas? I will refer to them as pheopara or PPGLs. They are a, um, a mouthful. Uh, very long names for both tumors. But they are tumors of cells that we call chromaffin. And these are the cells that produce uh, catecholamines, or adrenaline and noradrenaline. So uh, they are essentially the fight or flight response type uh, hormones. Uh, so anything that you can imagine in a, in a panic, or in a scare, in a fear, these are the symptoms that many of these patients have. So. Um, these tumors can be located in many different uh, uh, places. So we call pheochromocytomas the tumors that arise from the adrenal gland. So it's the core of the adrenal gland, the inside part of it, that is neurocrest related. And that's kind of how uh, neuroendocrine tumors uh, come from. So they, they come from the neurocrest. But outside, so pheochromocytomas are those that are located in the adrenal gland. And, but there are also tumors outside the adrenal gland in cells that are related to those, and those are called paragangliomas. And they can occur anywhere from the base of the skull all the way to the pelvis. Uh, so as long as they are outside the adrenal gland, they are called paragangliomas. 
So um, what? Uh, so then, this is a repetition of what I just said. So if they are in the adrenal, they're called pheochromocytoma. If they are in other locations, they're called paragangliomas. There is, in fact, a, uh, uh, a recent uh, proposal to call them all paragangliomas and just extend the name with the location. So adrenal paragangliomas, head and neck paragangliomas, chest paragangliomas, pelvic, and so on. So these are tumors that produce adrenaline and noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine. So these are the hormones that elevate blood pressure, give you your, uh, control your heart rate, sweating, and, and many other uh, uh, physiological functions. They happen almost equally between men and women. They happen in all races. They tend to peak between the third and the fifth decade of life, but they can be found anywhere from childhood all the way to uh, 80s and, and so on. So there's, they, they kind of cover a, a very broad range of ages. And the symptoms are those that I already mentioned, that the excess of catecholamines drive the tumors. So typically, patients will have high blood pressure, either constantly or in crisis, in uh, um, moments. And then it, it just normalizes in between. Most of these tumors are benign. Occasionally, they can metastasize. And this is really one uh, of the issues that we have with these tumors and the reason why we research them. They are normally treated with surgery, and that takes care of most of the cases. But some patients need to have uh, additional treatment, and the tumors can come back. And one of the reasons why they do is because um, 30 to 40% of these tumors are hereditary. This is different from any other human cancer or tumor. Uh, they are much more likely to be hereditary than any other tumor. So one, to, one in three patients will have a mutation that gets passed on to other family members. And this is a, a very important um, knowledge to be had about these tumors because not only the patient needs to be tested for mutations, but the family members as well. So siblings, um, offspring, and sometimes the parents. Not everybody who carries a mutation will have disease. So, but it, they can transmit the disease to their descendants. So it's important because when we talk about these tumors, and if you have a mutation that is inherited, everybody in the family gets to be tested or should be tested and followed up accordingly. Because if you know that you have a tumor or if you have a mutation, you can look for the tumors in the locations that may, where, where they may arise from. Then um, you get to diagnose those tumors earlier at smaller uh, sizes. The risk of having complications from these tumors, like cardiovascular complications, which are a common problem, um, are much less. And overall, uh, the, the outcomes are much better if you know of your disease and you can follow it up. So <clears throat> there are about 20 different genes that can cause susceptibility to pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. And uh, so we need more research because we cannot always find a mutation in every case. So why do we need more research? Because right now, we can only diagnose a malignant pheo or para if we find metastasis. So we call them metastatic pheo or para. Don't even call them malignant because we cannot predict malignancy ahead of time. So this is obviously, from an oncologic perspective, a really bad uh, and late uh, um, uh, state, right? We don't want to be at a point where we have to, di we only diagnose the patients when they are very advanced in the disease. We want the opposite. We want to be able to detect the disease early, or even prevent it if we can. So uh, that helps us to improve and plan surveillance. If we know uh, that a patient will have a more aggressive form of the tumor, they should be followed in a different way than a patient that will have an indolent tumor. So we cannot distinguish both right now. Um, the chances of somebody carrying a mutation develop the tumor. We don't know why that happens, why some people will have a mutation for life. They will never have the tumors, while others will start so early in childhood and have uh, very aggressive tumors um, very early on. So um, 
The other point about the disease is that we need to have more treatment options because those metastatic cases have very limited uh, therapies available to them. So um, I'm a, a proud uh, uh, member uh, of and the director of the FIO Para Center for Research and Clinical Excellence at UT Health San Antonio. This is a designation by the FIO Para Alliance. We go through a process where they, they evaluate our abilities, the team that we have uh, put together, and the, the level of research that is done. So we're one of only two centers nowadays that have that designation. And uh, the FIOPARA Alliance is uh, always, uh, growing because they have some criteria to be a center of excellence. You have to have a multidisciplinary team. You have to offer clinical care, genetic counseling, and the genetic counseling is key here because I told you a third of the patients have uh, an inherited mutation. So the genetic counselors help the families, help the relatives, um, and advise them as to what to look for. And uh, we have the research. So <clears throat> this is uh, 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 some of the team members. My co-director, Dr. Raghunathan, the endocrine, uh, endocrinologist on the clinical side, Dr. Kitano on this uh, uh, surgical oncology, and a broad team of people in the clinic and in the lab, the genetic counselor team in and, uh, and the bottom, um, and I a uh, big highlight to them because they are a very close uh, companion and partners in this uh, journey. So <clears throat> uh, patients are um, a, a key component of this process and of this team, obviously. They drive the research, they drive the care, they drive the collaborations that we do, and um, they are the motivation for the questions that we ask that we try to address in the lab. So it's a, it's a very um, interactive uh, relationship that we have. And even though I'm in the lab, uh, I enroll patients, patients email me, and I uh, set up a call. We, we discuss if they are eligible to participate. And we, uh, the research that we do is just collecting samples from the patients, either blood or saliva, and then a piece of tumor when they have had a tumor or when they are planning to have a tumor uh, operated and removed. So we use those materials to try and find the genetic causes for the tumor, and um, whether it's a hereditary or non-hereditary form, and find new genes. Because there is, as you can see from this uh, pie chart, we know that about a third is a hereditary, or germline, as we call them. We know that uh, about 40% have a mutation just in the tumor, but not in the blood, so it's not going to be hereditary, and that is what happens in most other cancers. So the mutation is limited to the tumor, so you're not passing it on to other individuals in the family. It has different impact on what we do with that knowledge. And then there are, there's a still a group that we don't know, so we don't know how to advise them. So why, uh, when we have a germline mutation, it matters because then other individuals, as I mentioned, can be affected, but they are not going to have the same type of disease every time. So this is a, one of the, uh, the families that we had followed, and you can see that there were 12 siblings in this family, very large family, that um, because of this family, we were able to identify the gene that was causing the disease in this family. Half of them had the disease and the other half did not have the mutation. So it took us many years to get from the point where we had this family to the point that we could tell this is the gene that is causing the disease in this family. So now everybody in that family can be screened for that mutation, and now this gene is part of the panel of genes that is involved in pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma diagnosis. So it's really a, a process that takes a long time, it's painstaking. It, um, it's many years from the moment that you see an individual to the family and then to all the research that uh, is involved in finding the gene to eventually uh, what happens to those individuals and how we can provide them a program of surveillance and potential treatment. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, molecular biology and genetics and what goes behind it. So there are more than 20 genes that can cause pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, as I mentioned to you. And those are kind of listed there. There are a few more that um, 
have not been, uh, uh, it's not, they are not part of this, uh, this image, but what we found many years ago is that these tumors naturally uh, split themselves into two main groups. Um, and that was a, a important for us to know because the types of alterations in the cells that are caused by these mutations, they tend to converge into different uh, paths or pathways. And one of them is the pseudo-hypoxia pathway. So what is that? Pseudo-hypoxia is like fake hypoxia. And hypoxia means low levels of oxygen. So the cells in these tumors, and it's about half of the tumors, about half of FIOs and paras have that kind of profile. And what this, uh, happens in there is that the cells sense as if there were no oxygen uh, or not enough oxygen in there for them. And they trigger a whole set of reactions to try and counteract this lack of oxygen. And this makes the tumors be very vascular, meaning they have a lot of blood vessels. And that information was important because it created the notion that if you try to block those blood vessels from growing, then you can potentially block the tumor from growing. So one of the main uh, proteins that is responsible for this uh, response to low levels of oxygen is called HIF2-alpha. And it turns out that one of the genes that causes pheochromocytoma and other tumors, called VHL, the essence of what VHL does is to control the amount of HIF2-alpha that the cell has. And so the cell senses as if the tumor cell thinks that there's not enough oxygen. It keeps making these uh, very big uh, changes in, in the cells, and they start to proliferate looking for oxygen elsewhere and these uh, tumors can grow. So not just uh, FIO and para, but kidney cancers and others. And uh, so a few years ago, um, based on research like this, that motivated a, a Nobel Prize uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Kalin, Radcliffe, and Semenza in 2019, so important it was to understand how oxygen, how cells respond to oxygen, that research in this area led to the development of a drug that specifically targets that protein. And what happens there is that patients now can take a drug that inhibits the core of the tumor and what the tumors have that is wrong. So this drug is called Belzutifan. It was approved by the FDA in 2021. And in FIOS and paragangliomas, not just VHL, but all these genes that I'm citing here, succinate dehydrogenase, FH, and, and many of the other genes are also mutated in FIO and para. And the implications of that is that potentially patients that have any of those mutations can benefit from a drug that will cut the core of the tumor cells uh, reliance on, right? So Belzutifan is now on clinical trials in patients that have advanced pheo and paraganglioma, and also pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So these trials are ongoing. They're still enrolling or close to end of enrollment. I'm looking at, at, at Dan here. Um, and MD Anderson is one of the lead uh, sites for this trial. And uh, I think we have uh, big expectations that it's going to uh, make a, an important uh, impact on these patients. So I just wanted to also inform, uh, talk to you about cases where and not just genetic mutations, but they can occur together with some other conditions. So patients that live in high altitude, patients that are born with certain heart defects that lead to uh, low oxygen levels in the cells can have predisposition to this tumor. So it's important to study them under those very rare contexts. These are all rare situations. And years ago, we did just that and found that mutations in patients that have cyanotic heart disease, uh, uh, so patients that have cyanotic heart disease and develop these tumors, few of para, 90% of the cases, they have mutations in the gene that controls the uh, uh, oxygen, so the same HIF2-alpha gene. So it's, it's, there is a very close connection between pheopara and hypoxia and the, the signals that control oxygen. So we're very interested in understanding that because that informs us on where to go next, right? If they are dependent on, on hypoxia, will one drug be sufficient? 
Will they find ways to overcome that? Will that impact on new treatments that are developed and so on? So, um, but not all these, these uh, tumors have defect in hypoxia. They can have defects in other uh, uh, proteins called kinases. And we found a patient that did not have inherited mutation. And through screening the, for, metabolic, uh, for a, a sequence in this patient, we found that it had a fusion between two genes that were not meant to be together. They fused together as a new, brand new gene. And that gene was causing the tumor in this individual. And luckily, uh, there, is, there are two FDA-approved drugs that can control this particular uh, gene that is driving the fusion called RET. And uh, so there is a possibility that if the patient ever needs, the, the, there is a drug that can work on this individual. And in fact, it has been applied to a patient with metastatic disease with very good results. So um, finally, just to, uh, to end up uh, my, my presentation, I wanted to tell you about the story of this uh, model that was funded by NetRF in our grant. And this is a partnership with Dr. Alice Sorani. So one of the 80 collaborations is <laughs> this collaboration with Dr. Sorani at UCLA. So she developed an organoid system where we can take the tumor, break the cells apart, put them into plates, make them grow, and then use the plate to understand the tumor. So we can see where it goes. So you can see it on the left side. This is what the organoids look like. So it's the like a little tumor inside a plate, and not just the tumor cells, but the other cells that are around it. We can use that plate and give it a lot of drugs. So on the right-hand side, you're seeing our drug screen and where uh, you see things that are reddish, that means that that tumor is responding to that drug. So we have tested uh, in, in the few organoids that we tested. Or this is an earlier version of what we have. So we have now more tumors. Um, and we can see that some, uh, we can use belzutifan, this new drug, and see which tumors respond to it. We can use the other drug that I just mentioned, RET inhibitor, and see how the tumors respond to it so that we can more or less predict how the patients would respond to the drug and, and apply it individually. So um, I have partnered now recently from this um, initial uh, project. We uh, found out that we can take tumors from other places. So we started a collaboration with the MD Anderson. And um, um, our colleague Camilo Jimenez is in, in, and uh, Dr. Pro, Paul Graham, um, the team, they are sending samples to us in San Antonio. We can prepare them and make organoids out of them. So um, this is a, a, a very promising, I think, uh, possibility of studying these tumors. They lacked controls in a, a long time, lacked models. And I just wanted to shout out to our team. Um, I just one, one thing that I, before I leave, is just to say that I, I brought some pamphlets, brochures about these tumors. Uh, feel free to take them when you go out. And um, thank you very much for your attention.